So yeah, getting this thing started. How exactly would you describe what it is that you do? You know, what is your work here in this life? That, that's a deep question to start with. You know, <laughs> what's what's your purpose in life? Why are you here? Well, for me, my life can be divided into two very distinct parts. Before I was introduced to meditation and after. Mm. Before, it was just searching, uh, not even knowing what is it that I'm searching for. It's just searching in everything, you know, at work, at home, with friends, family, just searching. Now, the day I was introduced to meditation, in one way, my search ended. In another way, it just started. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was the first time I realized that I have found something, my search has actually led me to something meaningful. But I'm at a place where I have to start right from the scratch. Mm. Uh, understanding life in its entirety for the first time uh, without any assumptions. Up until then, it was all assumptions. I knew who I was theoretically. I knew what the world was theoretically. Yeah. Uh, so I had a conceptual understanding of life and I realized that meditation is to forget all that and simply go into the experiential dimension and see what life is as it is happening mm -hmm. when it actually touches you mm -hmm. even a moment after life is just a memory when it is happening that is the only moment when it is real so whatever it is it is in that moment when it's happening. But usually, our conception of life comes from recollection of what life is. So the moment we recollect, there is an intermixing of emotions, our own past prejudices and thought processes. So when we talk about life, we're not talking about life at all. We're talking about an individual life filtered through the prism of our past experiences. So meditation for me marked the, the, the shift where experience life in the moment without talking about it, without thinking about it. What it reveals to you in that moment is worth remembering, is worth recollecting, is worth sharing. Mm -hmm. So the way I see my life and what I do just before the talk, when there is a question, I take a few minutes and I go into my silence. Well, I'm there most of the time. I've spent most of my last 10 years in meditation. So the first three years, uh, I spent eight hours every day in meditation. Wow. So I left home. I rented a room. Uh, I cut, off, cut myself off from everything. You know, I quit my financial job, everything. I said, I want to do this. So three years, it was most intense uh, spiritual experience for me. Very painful in some parts, uh, deeply mystical in some parts, and moments of pure joy, pure understanding, pure connection. It's the whole range of emotions. I have not experienced that range of you know, emotional roller coaster journey ever since those three years were the most intense mm. so when i sit to deliver a talk i want to share from that depth i want yeah. to keep myself out as much as possible you know? mm -hmm. i want to forget me and just see if that space were to be communicating what would it say so as much as possible i try to connect with that space and just speak from there. Mm -hmm. It's only after I go back and listen to my talks, I'm surprised that I've spoken all these things. Yep. When I'm speaking, there is really no connection between, okay, deliberate. There's no deliberate conscious effort in trying to say anything. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is where I feel is, is the most value because for the first time, there is an opportunity to listen to something that is 
much less of a mind and more of a self. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Listen to the silence. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So it's more like I I see myself as in that moment, uh, you know, a vehicle for trying to put in words what silence actually feels like. In fact, <laughs> in every which way, I'm trying to describe a moment of silence, a moment of stillness. Basically, a moment of nothingness, which is extraordinarily hard to grasp intellectually. Mm-hmm. You know, I keep saying this, the most impossible thing is nothingness. Nothingness can only be imagined conceptually. But existentially, nothingness is impossible. Because even when you say there is nothing, there is an assumption that it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Even nothing is something. Conceptually. Even nothing is something. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why I talk about the moment of creation and the conceptual understanding that there was nothing before something. That's the basic assumption of creation. Otherwise, there is no creation. There is just a continuous process of creating. Mm. Forms come and go, but creation itself has always been there. It is just the space where creation is happening. Now, the space wasn't created. Silence wasn't created. Stillness wasn't created. It is simply what it is. But somehow, when we try to talk about creation, we go to that point in time and we say, there must have been nothing before this. But that right there to me is the biggest assumption. And from there, all stories of creation go into imagination as opposed to reality. Yeah. Because... There's a part of you that has always been here, that will always be here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. We're already off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to go back a little bit to the search. This search that you said you were on, is this something that is within all human beings, this search for the essence that you came to find in the silence? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is not. It is not even an individual search. See, for me, an individual is more of a mental construct. Your name, your form, what you do, what you don't do. Collection of all those we put together and we recognize as individual. Behind the individual is something universal. Consciousness, aliveness, beingness, which has nothing to do with the individual, which reflects through the individual, which shines through the individual. But it's always the same. Now, in a way, this entity that is separate from the individual, this light of consciousness, light of awareness, somehow has this inbuilt deep desire to be itself, to know itself. Mm -hmm. It's just like when you add, let's say, a little bit of sand or mud into water, you leave it for a while, the water becomes clear, things settle down. Now, you're not doing anything. The water does not want to become clear. Mm. The mud does not want to settle down, but it's still happening because there's somehow, there is an inbuilt mechanism of clearing things out, putting us in a space of clarity, which is a natural existential movement. In fact, life for us, for individuals, it's an effort. We have to do things, we have to think, we have to make things happen. But when we are not doing any of that, we naturally enter that space, which happens every night. Throughout the day, we do something, but then whether we want it or not, eventually we are drawn back to that silence, we are drawn back to that stillness. In fact, sleep itself is that existential process that reminds us that whether you are searching or not, I'll pull you back to that silence. Mm. Now, if you can make a conscious choice of searching, then you can know this process. You can do it consciously. Mm -hmm. So whether an individual knows it or not, search for silence, search for stillness, search for that pure moment of connection with life is existential and it's deep Mm -hmm. built. That is what we actually search for in everything throughout our lives. Our conception of beauty, our conception of happiness, 
our conception of bliss it's all connected to that one moment of pure connectivity with ourselves that is the moment of absolute bliss that is the moment of absolute happiness yeah. that is the moment of absolute joy we search for these things because we know deep down it's all there it's not unknown to us we cannot search for something that is totally unknown mm yeah <laughs> uh yeah mm-hmm. how can like, you search for something that you have no conception about oh uh, yeah that's very true yeah, yeah there's like a, there's an inkling in all of us of the stillness and silence absolutely even if it's very faint is that inkling for the search yeah that right. makes a lot of sense yeah so to embark upon this journey to the silence and stillness would you just recommend a regular meditation practice in our life yeah regular meditation is important but the way we understand meditation is even more important okay uh, there is a natural assumption that meditation is another activity it is it is something else you do you add to your routine of activities and that will help you to get there but meditation is something totally different it is a deceptive word uh, perhaps the most deceptive word because in meditation you're not doing anything meditation isn't a doing it is a way of being it is a way of non doing mm. so if non doing is the objective then it can become a very integral part of everything we are doing in everything we do there can be an element of non doing aha uh-huh. yeah which is where the idea of mindfulness comes from when you are aware of what you are doing when you are fully aware you are both doing and not doing at the same time you are both the doer and the watcher oh uh, yeah mhm now that is the purest form of meditation where you're not trying to stop the activity but you're trying to become aware of it yeah in that awareness you are creating a little bit of space between you and your activities so that eventually you can connect with that pure you mhm leaving aside the activities yeah because even when we sit in meditation uh there are a lot of things happening there meditation is not a passive process it's not even a silent process in fact i look at meditation as a very violent conscious intervention uh going into the depths of the mind if you sit and close your eyes your mind becomes more noisy it starts bringing out memories deep within connecting with silence happens as a natural consequence of having spent enough time in this chaos mm. once this chaos is understood there is no need to keep on digging it again and again because mm. we don't watch our thoughts enough uh connecting to silence seems like an impossible thing because you know i i say this a thought is basically basically an incomplete process a thought exists to complete itself a completed thought is a no thought Mhm. So all our thoughts are half thoughts basically. You know, they don't have the beginning, they don't have the ending. We are just aware of them somewhere in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. So we are trying to complete that process. Every image we see, every sound we hear, uh, every imagination of the future or of the past, they are all incomplete because the ultimate completeness is not a thought. but a moment of thoughtlessness but thoughts mm. don't get that for thoughts they try to complete using thoughts so if something is missing for the mind the only way it can complete that is by finding a few thoughts and piecing together a picture mm-hmm. but it never understands that the only obstacle for us to connect with the stillness with the silence is this continuously moving thought which is incomplete Mm. So meditation if you understand it as a process of watching the incompleteness it is watching this incompleteness long enough hard enough to a point where you understand what this incompleteness is 
and then life becomes the meditation life becomes a meditation and you settle into the moment because now for the first time you see the present moment as the solution and uh-huh. your thoughts as the problem mm. before wow. that we live in a world where we are looking for solutions in thoughts mhm so we're looking for a moment of imagination to see something to experience something after watching this process long enough through a meditative process a moment will come when there, there is an intuitive understanding of what completeness is an understanding that is so existential uh, your mind will never get it your mind will always be confused how is that you are finding this connection when i am not involved when i am not agitating you when i am not disturbing you and you seem to be perfectly all right without me <laughs> once the mind understands that initially it fights for a while after that it begins to settle it just sits in one corner and it says okay now i know my place in this big mansion i occupy one room that's about it yeah rest of it is other things silence stillness the whole experience of life which has nothing to do with thinking so for me meditation is about these two things one is understanding that it's not a doing it is a non doing and the second thing is meditation is physical it is not mental now this is very surprising to a lot of people mostly we tend to think meditation is more about the mind it's about controlling the mind it's about subduing the mind but it's more about the body body is our identity and our connection with life without the body there is really no pain there is no suffering there is no anxiety there is no fear nothing in the realm of thoughts you can just keep drifting you can keep on having one thought after another there is no need to be anxious of anything mm-hmm. there is no need to be afraid of anything but the moment you have a body there is fear of losing it this yeah. fear of death yeah the attachment absolutely the fear of death is the primary foundational fear on which every other fear is built we experience all of the fears as simple subsets of this one fear fear of dying you know for example even you know uh, not having enough Uh, resources let's say not having enough money that again is a fear of death the mind projects it hunger starvation and then eventually death what if we can connect to that part of us that has nothing to do with the body then meditation is actually a physical process so for me meditation is as much about movement as it is about stillness in fact all the meditations i teach are half movement and half stillness for example there is the intense moving meditation where every 2 minutes you move you you shake your head you move your upper body you actually create the disturbance and then you sit still what you can do is actually create conscious disturbance if you can create conscious disturbance when the disturbance stops meditation happens whether you want it or not mm. what we normally try to do is we try to run behind meditation we try to run behind peace we try to run behind relaxation without understanding that the process is exactly the opposite mm. we cannot run behind it and at the same time we cannot stop doing something that is our nature so the way to put these two together is do non meditation and allow meditation to happen ah uh, yeah mhm so move that is your conscious effort keep your awareness keep your watchfulness let's say on your breath on your thoughts but move and watch the movement the mind tries to relax but it finds it hard because you're moving constantly it is unable to watch the breath but when you stop the mind immediately wants to relax because it has gotten that opportunity to relax 
it has been tra- trying for the last two minutes trying to relax but you've been constantly shaking now it sees its opportunity and goes a lot deeper than you would normally go mm. so in a way you have tricked the mind mm. into going deeper into relaxation by pushing it to the other extreme yeah wow that's Paul said it does seem like tricking the mind <laughs> yeah it is so because other than that we are already enlightened we are mm. already <laughs> in an awakened realm yeah what is blocking us from seeing this is the trickery of the mind mm. mm-hmm. now the easiest way to go beyond the trickery of the mind is to trick it again <laughs> trick it into forgetting itself wow yeah that's powerful stuff <laughs> yeah trick it into tricking itself yeah <laughs> wow because yeah. that's the only language the mind understands mhm uh, mind does not understand what we say to it directly but trickery it understands yeah that is why i say any habit why does it take about 20 to 30 days for you to change a habit because the mind does not understand language it does not understand conversation let's say you're addicted to smoking and you tell your mind okay i don't want you to smoke from tomorrow it won't understand that at all mm. for that mm. for the mind it is just another thought process and it forgets all about it but if you're able to trick it over the course of next 20 30 days into forgetting you know to smoke it will pick it as a habit mm. so in everything mind has to be tricked but because we have a different way of interacting with the mind we see the mind as something very intelligent something something smart creative we attribute all the qualities of the self to the mind but the mind is totally blind mind is blind to conversations blind to uh, you know our needs and desires what the mind understands is pattern to change the pattern it takes some time you know i give this example mind is a blind man in a dark room hmm. now the only way it has learned how to move efficiently is through practice it knows where the table is it knows where the chair is because it has walked in that dark room enough it is very comfortable there it appears like it knows what's happening there but it it does not know anything the way to know this is take the mind and put it in a new environment it completely freezes it does not know what to do yeah it has to relearn everything that is why every new habit takes time because it's in a new environment it has to learn all the tricks again mhm mhm this to me is a is a very important understanding of the mind which has deep implications on addiction on our habits on our lifestyle yeah Um, mm-hmm. if you want to change the mind just trick it <laughs> uh i've never heard it put like that but i like that a lot yeah it's very true um a saying that i like to remember and that you've probably heard and other people have probably heard is that the difference is the mind goes from the master to the servant when before you know before this revelation coming into our being it was the opposite it was the mind was the master and the greater self was the servant to the mind you could say um so yeah it's a it's a, just a different way to go about living ultimately um yeah. but let me ask you this one would you say that you know the mind is still it's still present you know the thoughts still come and go in its servitude to the greater self does the behavior change of the mind like do does the mind stuff change once we do successfully trick it and then from that our life changes like our behavior changes in life our our will maybe you could say changes from that um successful trickery well um one is the actual contents of the mind that can be changed through time through conscious intervention what the mind thinks about can be changed but that change is temporary a more direct and permanent way of changing the mind is putting some distance between you and the mind so that you are always in control 
Mm-hmm. Well, you spoke about the master and the servant relationship. In our normal daily consciousness, the mind is the master. The self is its servant. In fact, self is so obscure. Once in a while, we come to the self. Otherwise, we are mostly lost in the mind. Yeah. Mind hates the present moment. Hmm. Mm-hmm. It hates nothing more than the present moment. That is why you can take a walk, but your mind will not take a walk with you. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It wants to be somewhere else. Yeah. The mind loves being in its own world of ideas. And what it hates the most is the present moment interfering with it. Because present moment is not just a moment. It is aliveness. It is consciousness. It is awareness itself. So when the mind comes to the present moment, it is coming into the light. All its trickery, all its deceptions that it has learned in the dark are useless in the present moment because they're all revealed. And it does not like that. Hence, it always tries to keep you in that darkness. It wants to always be somewhere else. Now, this is the very nature of the mind. Of course, if you go deeper into the concept of the mind uh, from the ancient Vedic scriptures, mind is consciousness itself. The pure mind, without any thoughts, is the very space through which life is happening. Mm-hmm. It's the phrase Brahman or the vast mind. So for Hindus, creation is Brahman. Mm-hmm. And Brahman is simply two words. Pra is vast. And man is mind. Mm. In fact, man, the mind, is where we get the words man and woman. It's just a slightly different pronunciation. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. So man himself is just mind. Uh A mind that has attached itself to a set of activities that revolve around form, that revolve Mm. around action, doing something. But the pure mind, the vast mind, is always free. It is free of thoughts, free of attachments. So in a way, tricking the mind is really reminding the mind that it is so much vaster than just the collection of thoughts and experiences. Reminding it. Reminding it. (laughs) What it has forgotten. It It simply forgets. Every moment, the mind loves to forget reality and live in its its world. So these are two completely different worlds. Mind is a world of its own. The moment you fall into the mind, you're falling into a tunnel. That's why it's hard to get out of the mind because you got to find the exit. The exit is not everywhere. It's a tunnel. Every thought is a tunnel. There are few exit points that you have learned how to get out of. So each thought sucks you in Getting out of that thought is a learned behavior. You know there are points, exit points, where you can get out. Otherwise, you can be stuck in that thought, in that world of thoughts for as long as you want. Mm -hmm. Mind, as in the collection of thoughts, will always be this. It will always be a deception. It will always be a world of its own. So in a way, every time you look at your form, every time you look at your life, your entirety of everything you've done as far as reality is concerned it is nothing it has not even registered on the screen of reality it is just a happening as buddha beautifully says i mean there's the candle flame if you blow the flame out where did the candle flame go now Mm -hmm. it did not go anywhere because it was never there in the first place it was a phenomenon each flame was taking birth and dying every moment. Yeah. So there is no one flame that extends beyond a moment. It's mm. the same thing with the body. It's the same thing with the mind. Every moment, this perceptual reality is taking birth and dying. But it's happening so fast, so seamlessly, that we don't see the dying process. We quickly keep moving from one flame to another. Mm-hmm. meditation mm-hmm. is really a process of slowing the mind down enough to see this process of birth and death of the moment of the mind in the moment uh-huh yep which is seeing the truth 
seeing the truth. The moment we can see that the mind is a phenomenon, it is not a reality. Uh, it is a shadow. It is shifting, it is changing, but it has nothing of its own. All my desires are accumulated desires. All my thoughts are accumulated thoughts. Everything I know about myself is an accumulation. It's a conversation that I've been having with myself. But I am real. I exist. You know, I am not imaginary. My aliveness is not imaginary. My consciousness is not imaginary. Because I am the same when I was five, when I am now. You know, when I can just step away from my form, my perception of aliveness is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And not only my perception, it's the perception of everybody else around me and all the creatures of existence. Even the ones I regard as dead, they all have the same perception of aliveness because aliveness is not a perception. Aliveness is the very fabric on which everything is added. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just a way of interacting with the mind to firstly get to a point where you don't listen to any conceptual theoretical understanding of what life is. The conversations, the explanations the mind gives for what life is, is useless in the world of meditation and experiential learning. Mm -hmm. uh, if the mind says, this is what the body is, it is made of this. There is no way you can transcend the body. There is no way you can connect with some deep stillness because you are a collection of bones and muscles. That's just the mind. Yeah. Trickery is basically to have this conversation, keep watching the mind long enough where the mind understands that there is some other entity here that is alive, that is conscious, that is more intelligent than me. Yeah. Yep. So it will use its trickery when it's necessary for survival. But in internal conversations, it will, it will just stay quiet because it knows it is in the presence of a self that is the master. Now, mm. It naturally assumes the position of a servant. Mm -hmm. Wow, very well said. Mm. The mind of the mind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. yeah, mind is its own mind. <laughs> oh, wow. Um. Okay, where do we go from here? <laughs> <laughs> so the difference is when we think we are just the mind, we're living in an illusion, and it's all illusion because it's all transitory, right? Yes. And then once one dwells in the present moment with the greater self, with the capital S, we find something that is within us that we are, that we always were and always will be, that I amness that is not quite transitory. And yes. that's the big difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's huge. <laughs> um, so just to experience that island of stillness and watch the movement all around it. Mm, mm. The very fact that there is movement implies that there is stillness. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. They, they mirror each other. The more the movement on the outside, if we can watch that movement, we can connect with the stillness within. You know, that's why I say we find our greatest thrill when either the mind or the body is moving very fast. That is why skydiving is exhilarating for one part of our being and totally scary for another part. Of course, yeah. the body is freaking out, the mind is freaking out. But what is it that you're experiencing that you eventually call thrill? You are experiencing the thrill of connecting with stillness. Mm. Because your body is moving so fast, nobody is stopping it. It is helping you to connect with that stillness that you are. It is that stillness that is enjoying putting you through that torture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm. So in a way, for the mind and the body, racing is excitement, but not for themselves because they act as beautiful mirrors to show stillness. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stillness is that moment of 
bliss, that moment of joy. We know how to get to it accidentally, but we don't know how to get there consciously. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. That makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. But the path of yoga, you could say, if you want to call it that, this what we're talking about here is to do it consciously, is to do it deliberately. Yeah. It is. Um, it's it's that moment, you know. In fact, to me, that is the most important moment when an individual looks back, looks at his entire life, and says, "I have lived unconsciously. Unconsciousness has been my reality, has been my friend's reality, has been the reality of the world around. Let me." live consciously when when an individual makes the choice very firmly right there enlightenment happens mm -hmm. but to know that it has happened it will take next few years mm. but it's mm -hmm. really that moment you now to me when buddha left home that moment when he said okay this is fine i have all the luxury all the comfort i have everything i need but i am not there I don't know who I am. I don't see myself in all these activities. I want to be with myself. In a way, what he was saying is, I want to be conscious. I want to be alive. I want to be. All my life, I have just been trying to see what's happening on the outside and become that. My life has been a becoming. It's just a moment when you put your foot down and say, well, I'm going to stay true to my name. I'm a human being. I'm not a human becoming. <laughs> That's good. All my life, I'm becoming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, let me, human is my mind. Human are my thoughts. Human are my actions. But being is who I am. Mm -hmm. A human yeah. cannot exist without being. Mm -hmm. It is just a matter of saying, well, this is what people call me. They call me a human being, but who am I? What is this human being? And why two words? You know, this is another amazing thing. It is only human beings we identify with these two distinct names. Almost all other species, all other animals, we just have one name, one word. Wow. Because there is no separation in them between the mind and the being. It's all unconscious activity. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, but I'm running through all the animals right now trying to think of one that has two names. There might be a few, but I cannot think of any. I can't either. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. It's because we, right from the beginning, we understood that a human being is very different from all other creatures of existence, only in this aspect, that a human being can be aware and conscious of himself or herself. Now, that is the being part. Now, we are that. We are constantly reminded about that in all our stories, uh, in all our scriptures. In fact, now when I read a story, even as far removed as it is from a spiritual scripture, I still see the same story. Mm -hmm. I mean, in our comic books, in our cartoons. Even in stories that seem to be so fictional, that has nothing to do with enlightenment and self-realization, I just see a distortion of one story that we've been telling ourselves again and again. Yep. Yep. That there is something inside us, when we touch that, when we discover that, we get access to this limitless power. And our quest on the inside, on the outside, is for limitless power. I mean, in that sense, Nietzsche was right when he said, life is, you know, will to power. Initially, when he said it, people thought, is he joking? I mean, human beings love, human beings are compassionate, human beings are this and that. But if you go to the depth of each and every human being, you can see that we are constantly trying to become everything. Oh, yeah. And that's what brings us in conflict with everything. We are not satisfied just being that limited mind and body. Mm. If we are put in a place, we want to acquire as much power 
over people, over that place, over that environment. Because deep down, we are that absolute seat of power. Mm -hmm. That consciousness, that aliveness, which cannot be subservient to anything. Yeah. So deep down, because we know this, it is very hard for us to accept bondage, accept the idea that we can be subservient to something. So if mm -hmm. there is an opportunity to acquire power that puts us above someone or something, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is human history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's really good stuff. Oh. <sighs> this is good. <laughs> so is it is it um, like the will changes toward using the power to actually become a willing servant you know is that where this kind of ends up it's like our empowerment leads us to a sense of servitude to this greater self or from the stillness from the silence would you say that there is like some sort of obligatory servitude like a, a surrender you could say yeah it's um well, when our will to power get to that place where, see, power is again a slightly confusing word. A better word would be immortality, quest for a place that does not know death. Mm -hmm. If it is permanent, if it is eternal, if it is not possible for it to be taken away, that is what we want. That is the direction in which everything is moving. Mm. That is the direction in which we are pushed. We want to get to that place where we can stand on this island of stillness for the first time, having been swimming in the ocean of life, trying to stay afloat. We know the island is there. We know if only we can get to it, the quality of life, the movement of life, the way we experience things, everything changes dramatically. It's the difference between drowning and taking a walk. Mm. It's the same body, same mind, two completely different experiences. So it's like the difference between entropy and momentum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what you mean by power. I get it. Yeah, yeah, power is on on the inside. It is to get to the purest part of our being. On the outside, it manifests as many different things. Mm -hmm. When the mind tries to get to power because it does not understand what this true power is, it always tries to get it in something that it can never get. The mind tries to give you a sense of power because Ultimately, the mind wants to satisfy you. If you want to feel powerful, the mind will try to give you that sense of power. It will give you lots of ideas to acquire that power. But because it is blind, it cannot see that the power that it is pushing you towards is not permanent. Mm. Let's say the mind says, become the president of the country. You will be all powerful. It feels good. It works towards it. It gets there. But when it gets there, it understands that this is not the power I was searching for. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still powerless on the inside. Uh, I still haven't conquered death. I don't know what life is. Yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. To turn it inward, to turn the quest for power inward, is the trick and is the spiritual process. It's the mm -hmm. same process, but turning it inward. Yeah. Ramdas has a saying like that goes sort of like uh, we attain all the power we've ever wanted when we give up the striving for power. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of what I meant by surrender. It's like we, uh, when we give it all up, that's when we get it all. But that's the irony in it. It's when right. we, yeah, when we surrender the, the striving for anything, really. Uh, yeah, but this is this is a very beautiful form of surrendering. 
on the inside surrendering is very positive on the outside it's bondage yeah because you're surrendering to something or someone mm-hmm. on the inside because you're surrendering to the ultimate to the self that has no need to keep you in bondage surrender to that is actually liberation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah you're absolutely right when you say that moment when you say let me surrender to that process to that yeah. thing on the inside yeah. let me put that aliveness put that consciousness put this present moment ahead of me ahead of my thoughts ahead of my actions and just establish a relationship with the now mm. relationship with the now mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's what slowly builds and eventually now will have an equal say as of now the relation is relationship is totally lopsided you know the now wants to say something but the mind is like no just be there mm. even if we are able to get to that equal space where half the time we are lost in our thoughts and our minds and half the time we are connected to the present moment that itself is a totally different quality of living mhm mm <sighs> yeah so let me ask you this one if we could explain maybe for somebody that has no clue what we're talking about right now what the incentive to all of this is why would one even want to have this in their life uh you know why would one want to partake in meditation or have a sense of self inquiry and surrender to the now what's all this about you know how would you say this is the the good news per se for someone okay well it's just a fundamental difference between truth and lies okay imagine if i were to uh, give you an option to enter a digital world i mean now that we are partially in the digital world it will be a useful example the matrix you say yeah anything if you were to enter into a digital world and live there yeah you know, uh, with much less pain much less suffering uh, you know a world that is created for you meticulously designed to keep you engaged keep you entertained a lot more peaceful beautiful world now why would you choose a reality as opposed to that because it's the truth reality yeah. is the <laughs> truth and yeah. that is a lie yeah so similarly in relationship between the mind and the self the self is the truth the mind is a lie mm. mind is a deception we are stuck in it we are lost in it so what is the incentive it is to get to the truth mm. well it's just a philosophical understanding now is ignorance truly bliss i would say no it's not if moving towards your true nature is clearing out the ignorance then that has to be the right thing mhm which is truly What, bliss yeah which is true bliss yeah whatever you get along the way are just bonus you know additional things but the most important thing is the clearing of the veil of deception it is to see the true nature of your being in all its glory in all its magnificence Mm-hmm. it is to see yourself in a tree it is to see yourself in a bird yeah it is to see yourself in the sky it is to see that life is a, is your dream it is not a dream it is your dream mm. and everything that has happened in your life has happened because at the center of it you have always been there life is a weaving of the dream around you it's just that you have become so attached to this dreaming process you've become so good at this dreaming process that you have forgotten the dreamer altogether yeah mhm so the biggest incentive is to move towards truth and most importantly uh, what will happen to the you that fully understands aliveness is your very nature what happens to your conception of death now okay what is the certainty that you just took birth in this lifetime how can you be certain 
that you've not been here for a really long time. I can't. You've just been playing this game in different forms, in different ways, yep. again and again and again. Now, we cannot even be sure that the individuals of the past are totally new, different individuals. For all you know, some of them were you. Mm -hmm. The only reason we are able to endure life, enjoy life, forgetting all that, is because we have no memory of our past lives. Ah. We are living blissfully in ignorance. Mm. Now, if that is the case now, it will be the same a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now. Till you make a conscious decision to wake up, you will be stuck in this realm of dreaming where you will always be attached to some form. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're attached to form, you are always attached to suffering. Because form, mm -hmm. because it's incomplete, it is a process. To keep it alive, to keep it going, you have to suffer. Ah, uh, yeah. So the yep. biggest incentive in waking up is to clear out the ignorance of many lifetimes and many lifetimes to come. So meditation appears like a very slow process. It, it is taking its own sweet time. But the transformation that is happening is so deep, is hmm. so unimaginably existential and eternal. When you actually experience that moment of enlightenment, you will have nothing but gratitude towards this entire process. In fact, you will look at your whole effort and say, is this it? I've mm. been asleep for thousands of years and it only took me a few years to wake up. <laughs> yeah, some kind of joke in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so essentially the greatest incentive of this whole process is the transcendence of our suffering. Right. Yeah. That's huge. Suffering, yeah. Suffering, you know, Schopenhauer says, pleasure is negative. Suffering is positive. Pleasure is just absence of suffering. Mm. Suffering is the real thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Suffering is what we are most familiar with at the physical level, at the emotional level, at the mental level. Suffering is our home. Once in a while, we open the door and step out and experience a moment of joy, a moment of bliss. But we eventually come back and lock ourselves in the world of suffering because that is the body, that is the mind. As long as you are living in this realm where you are disconnected from reality, suffering is inevitable. Mm. Mm -hmm. Instead of once in a while accidentally experiencing a moment of bliss and joy, if we can move towards it consciously, then that becomes the process, that becomes the journey to slowly illuminate this dark house that's the mind that's the body and to turn everything into light every thought into light every physical thing into light eventually it merges into just aliveness pure aliveness yeah and it's such a magnificent process where you are not letting go of anything even after your enlightenment you can come back to the mind you can come back to the body they don't disappear yeah, you know, that's why there has not been a single case where an individual has died at the moment of enlightenment. <laughs> it has never happened. Mm. You always come back. Always come back. You always come back because the mind is very powerful. The body is very powerful. This is where the idea of karma comes into the picture. Till the body finishes its karmic activities, what it has accumulated, even though you're enlightened, the body is still alive. The mind is still alive and it has to complete that process. But now you're not in any hurry to finish this process. You're not worried about this process because you're not finding any meaning in this process. Because you have found meaning by yourself, by realizing yourself. Wow. So you let the game continue. You go to your football match and watch it. But at the end of it, whatever happens, you know how to forget that and move on. Yeah. Yeah. But yep. with life, that's the problem. If something happens, we can't just move on because we find ourselves in our activities, in what we do. Wow. Yeah. Very well said. Yes, the show goes on. It's <laughs> less attachment to how the show goes. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Less attachment, but it goes on. 
mm-hmm. you just mm-hmm. watch it you know slowly it's just like a wave initially it's very turbulent because you are adding to that turbulence yeah every time the wave is moving up you get more excited than the wave and you push it higher and every time the wave goes down you get more depressed and push it down mm-hmm. but when you step aside because there's no one pushing the wave higher or lower eventually it has to stop eventually it has to settle which is the actual definition of the word samadhi samadhi is enlightenment quite literally it means equal mindedness samadhi mm. he is mind sama is equal mm-hmm. so when the mind is not wavering that is enlightenment mm. equanimity yeah absolutely yeah you know, it's interesting the word for samadhi uh, the word for enlightenment is the same as the word for a graveyard in hindu Sanskrit? scriptures samadhi is also a place where you're buried that's wow. that's your that's where your body is that that is called your samadhi ah. and that is also the state of enlightenment so in a way when you look at uh, the burial place you are simply saying this person is in that state of equanimity he is no longer agitated by the mind and the body mm mm-hmm. yes that brings up the saying of um i think it's a buddhist saying not 100% sure but it's the fact that you have to die before you die and that's how you reach right. the equanimity absolutely mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah wow yeah that's powerful stuff this is a really good conversation um wow <laughs> So it goes pretty deep yeah but then, yeah intellectually yeah it's very difficult to get a sense of everything but once you start doing it experientially doing it practicing it uh, it'll just happen now you know getting back to your question uh, our conversation you asked uh, what is it what is it that we have to do as a process as a practice Yeah. will regular practice get us there more than regular practice the most important thing initially is intensity of longing intensity of that search mm. where you can say for the next few days for the next few months i want to dedicate all my time and energies for this but for me my first one month of meditation was the most intense i don't do it so completely i just said because you know i wasn't sure if meditation is going to work and i didn't want to spend all my life with something that that isn't useful because before you begin your meditation you're looking at it as something useful you want to get something out of it yeah like a utility yeah i had quit my job four years in thomson reuters and I'm like okay this is my world finance numbers i didn't like numbers but then i like the job but then if i have to pick up something new i simply told myself i'm going to give it one month i'm going to give it everything one whole month i won't be distracted by anything else at the end of one month if i don't feel something if i don't experientially connect with something then i will drop it so that's how i went into meditation like for about 8 hours every day sometimes even more but then meditation was the most important thing but i never sat for more than 1 hour at a time always 1 hour and then a break 10 minutes break or a 15 minutes break oh okay and i used mm-hmm. to read when i was reading the longing was to go and sit in meditation because reading was intellectual mm mm-hmm. So when mm-hmm. i'm reading ramana maharshi the moment he says the cell i feel what i'm reading is useless i need to connect with this cell yeah i throw the book and try to connect with it so this process went on very intensely at the end of one month it was more than clear that this is the way this is the path mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. after that it was not hard to convince myself that this is what i need to be doing and it wasn't hard to convince those around me but initially it was next to impossible to convince because i don't know what it is yeah 
Yeah. It's not possible to trust others, but you can trust yourself mm. when you have touched something. Mm-hmm. Yep. This whole process. And, oh, yeah. go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. So that intensity is the most important thing. And that is why still one of the best ways of beginning is to go to a place, go to a center, go to a community, go to a place where this is the most important thing. Searching for yourself is the most important thing. Yep. Of course, you will not be doing this all your life, but when you're doing it, it has to be done with full involvement, full intensity. Mm -hmm. After this, you can settle into it. You can mm -hmm. accommodate activities. You can bring in your lifestyle. You can blend it. Because now you know what this is, what it takes. But the problem is, initially when people try to pick up the habit of meditation, they try to add it to their existing lifestyle. They do not see it as something so foundational that their life has to revolve around it. At least initially, everything has to be rearranged to accommodate this process. Mm -hmm. The searching has to be the most intense. Yeah. You know, as that story in the Upanishads go, a student asks the teacher, I want to become enlightened. How do I intensify my search? You know, he dunks him in the water, keeps his head under the water. His boy struggles to breathe and finally he lets him out. He says, you know, uh, how badly did you want to breathe? If you can ask for enlightenment with that much intensity, you will get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And intensity reduces time. The more intense you're longing, the lesser time it takes. Mm-hmm. Because time is anyways an illusion. It's just... Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very well said. Yeah. One has to be very earnest in that respect. Earnest and intense. Yeah. Until they don't have to be intense anymore. That's the irony as well. Right. It just <laughs> happens. Yeah. You mm. actually settle into that rhythm. Mm. Yeah. Settle into the rhythm. Because then you're not fighting with life. You see life as a surface movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is so much depth to your being. Once you know that there is depth to it, you're not worried too much about what's happening on the surface. Once in a while, you arrange things. But you don't get attached to that surface movement. Yeah. When you want to, you simply sink a little deeper. And that's where your peace is. That's where your joy is. Mm. In solitude, in silence, what you can find there, you will not be able to find it in the company of a million people. There's something so complete. You are so complete when you're alone. Sometimes so alone that there's not even a conversation in the mind. The deepest moment of aloneness. Not mm. loneliness, but aloneness. Aloneness. Yeah. Yeah, loneliness is depressing. Loneliness is you are pushed into it. Aloneness is you have chosen it. Yeah, yeah. So two completely different things. I like that. Think of alone, how it's spelled, all one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference between loneliness and Yeah, aloneness. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> all oneness. All oneness. <laughs> uh, yes. So well said. Um. Honestly, I think that's a good note to wrap this up at. Uh, I think we were pretty comprehensive and thorough in this whole thing, and I don't know how much more we can say. This was a wonderful talk. Uh, you are a very, very wise man. I appreciate you so much for coming on here. It's an honor for me to do this. Um, do you have any last words? Anything else you want to say for the pod before we wrap this up? Um, well, just trust yourself more than the mind that mm. has been my whole journey initially we trust the mind we trust the conversation we don't trust that conversation we have with silence meditation is all about that conversation with silence trusting that silence yeah the day you can listen to your mind and not care about what it's saying in a way you've arrived mm. So mm. that that would be the most important thing take away something from this talk it is to have that relationship with silence as opposed to 
the noise in the mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's your voice. Yeah, it, it has all the contents. It knows your life entirely. So it knows exactly what to say, how to say it. But because the mind does not know the truth, it does not know the direction in which it's heading, it is very efficient but you would not trust a very efficient blind man to help you cross the road. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That shifting back to more existential dimension. Yeah. Start exploring that when you're walking, when you're sitting and eating, when you're interacting with people. Uh, Put a chair, put a seat for silence and make him sit there. Make him watch your life. Make him watch every moment of what you're doing. Eventually, that thing will become everything. Mm. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Gary. I mean, it's Thank it's you. a pleasure. I mean, I, I love these conversations. Your questions were very deep right from the beginning. So <laughs> I like to get right into it. That's probably why the, the conversation was deep. <laughs> I think so, right? Why waste time? Get yeah. right into it. Dive deep. Yeah. Um, yes. Know thyself and trust thyself. Absolutely. Very well said. I thank you so much, Nirvana, for coming on here. Thank uh, you. Keep doing your thing. I wish you all the best for the future. And for anybody that listened this long, everything's down in the description, all of your links. And uh, yeah, keep on keeping on. Peace and love to you. And peace and love to the listener. All right. Goodbye.